we have here Professor Jeremiah Alberg from International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. Who, and I would like to start off by asking you, uh, when did you first hear about Professor René Girard? Okay. And uh, how did you encounter him after you heard him about him? So I uh, somehow managed to uh, go all the way through my education, including uh, a doctorate in Germany without ever hearing the name René Girard. Uh, and I was, at the time, I was a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit. And after the uh, doctorate, I went to the final phase of training of the Jesuits called tertianship in Manila in the Philippines. And uh, a very dear and close friend of mine uh, was also part of that program. And he brought with him uh, two cassette tapes by Gil Bailey, again, someone I had never heard of. Uh, and so I listened to them. And uh, in those tapes, the name uh, Rene Girard kept coming up. And what interested me at the time uh, very much was, uh, although my uh, degree was in philosophy, uh, as a Christian and also as a priest, uh, I, I had for myself a question, and it had also been asked by people, why is God so violent in the Old Testament? And I realized I didn't have any satisfactory answer, either for myself or for others. So I was kind of looking for something that might help me to understand uh, that. And Gill's approach uh, did that. It really helped me a lot. Uh, but it was clear to me that it was based on uh, Renee's thought. And so I went right then to the library uh, where we were at the Ateneo. It's a university in, the, in Manila. And uh, the only book they had was uh, Violence in the Sacred. So I checked it out and I read it. And I just remember thinking, I, I just don't get this. I don't, I don't see uh, how this is connected to the Old Testament and to violence and uh, scriptures and things like that. And uh, but I kept, uh, you know, hearing things from Gill that made me think uh, that Renee's thought had to be important. So. I think the next book I got was uh, uh, Things Hidden. And that's when it just really opened up for me. It really uh, started to make a lot of sense. And then I went through and read uh, The Corpus uh, at that point. Uh, and so I was very excited about it. And uh, it was, I felt it was helping me a lot. And in my, I returned to Japan from the Philippines. I started my teaching career. Uh, and as I was teaching, I was using uh, more and more of uh, Renee's thought. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the idea of his approach to anthropology and things like that. At the same time, I was reading uh, a lot of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So from my dissertation, part of my dissertation had been about Rousseau, and I didn't feel that I had really understood him. So I was rereading him with the hope of uh, eventually writing something on him. And so, I, you know, if you read uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and René Girard at the same time, uh, there are obvious places where they come together uh, and in places where I found Girard's approach very illuminating for understanding the text of, uh, uh, of Jean-Jacques of Rousseau. And in particular, I found the notion of scandal uh, to be really helpful. And it was something that I didn't think anyone else had paid much attention to in Rousseau's writing. And in fact, it's... Uh, it's really uh, massively present in certain writings. Uh, and then even in those where it's not so present, it's still there uh, in the sense that he, he was just sort of a scandalous person. Uh, so I ended up writing a, uh, 
uh, paper on the first discourse, the discourse on the arts and sciences and scandal. And it was published and, and I sent that to uh, Rene. So that was my first contact and I got an answer back from what him. What year was that? 1999 or 2000. Okay. So I started reading him in 1993. Uh, that would have been when I was in the Philippines, 93, 94. And I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't write anything uh, using him until 1999. And uh, although I had had some contact with Gil in the meantime, uh, I hadn't had any direct contact with uh, Rene. So the first thing I heard directly from him was uh, a, a short note from him thanking me for it and saying it was interesting. And then saying, if I ever came to the United States to please look him up and giving me his phone number. And so I was coming up on a sabbatical at that point, and I was going to, uh, I actually worked it out that I could go to Santa Clara University, which is just about 20 minutes away from Stanford. And uh, so through that, I was able to begin participating in these uh, twice a month seminars that Robert Hamilton Kelly organized on the Stanford campus. And uh, I gave a paper uh, there. And uh, for the next, I think, almost two years was more or less a regular participant in those meetings. What is your favorite book of Rene's? Yeah, I, I, uh, it, as other people often say, it's the one I'm reading. Uh, but I suppose. On, on the one hand, for the most comprehensive view of it, it remains uh, Things Hidden. Uh, I really love that book. Uh, but if I just want to pick up something and sort of be uh, edified, uh, I've, somehow the book on Dostoevsky uh, really, uh, there are just passages in it that I, I think are very, uh, they're very spiritually uplifting. Uh, or else they're they're spiritually humiliating in a good sense that it, it the 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 uh, notion of pride and uh, what pride does to us uh, I find very uh, this is helpful. The book that Jim Williams translated into yeah English. yeah yeah what are your thoughts on his last book Madeline to the end when it came out first of all. Uh, I do, I read French, but I don't, uh, I'm not uh, really fluent in it. Uh, and so I try to work through some of the French and I don't feel like I'm quite getting it. And I was listening to other people at the time and I just didn't uh, feel that I understood it. And so then the uh, English translation came out and I worked through it more carefully, more slowly. And I was blown away by it. Be Partly because, in my own opinion, I felt like things, uh, no, I felt like uh, I saw Satan fall, didn't really break any new ground, uh, that it was simply a different presentation of a lot of things that had gone before it, uh, in some ways a, a very good presentation. But, and so to, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't expecting anything new. And uh, then you read this book and it just, uh, and I was with him some of the time that he would have been composing this book and right, he never talked about Clausewitz. I mean, at least I don't remember anything about Clausewitz. So in many ways, it was kind of uh, uh, sh a shock in that sense that I was, boy, there's still, he's still got some more to say. And uh, for me, I, uh, I, I used it then to write something, uh, again, on Rousseau, on Rousseau's letter to D'Alembert, the letter on the theater. And what I found at first just helpful was the notion of achave, of completing someone, uh, that it requires that you read them from this mimetic viewpoint. 
uh, and that that's how he was going to read Clausewitz, and that that's how I was trying to read Rousseau. And and I I can't list it all, but he had like three steps in what he means by Ashabe, and I found that to be a, a very helpful methodological uh, approach to reading an author. Now, when you get into the actual content, uh, I will still find quotes from other people, especially people who are criticizing it, that do shock me a little bit. It's like, I don't even remember reading that. Uh, about withdrawal, for instance, that there seems to be a very hemp, heavy emphasis in uh, Girard at this point of kind of withdrawing from the world. And I'm not sure that that's the best advice to give to a young person. <laughs> and so I, I find it kind of a, a, a book that is very Augustinian. It is a book of, uh, of an older person. And uh, in that sense, it's filled with a lot of wisdom. But I'm also not surprised that some people are either disappointed in it or uh, don't really want to accept some of uh, its conclusions. I, I, you know, I think for some of the younger people, say, "Well, wait another forty years, and you're probably <laughs> more on board with it." Do you think it is an apocalyptic book? At least that's what he said. In yeah, yeah, it is. And I just read a quote from recently that his, something like history has a meaning, and its meaning is terrifying. Right. Right. And I can understand where a lot of people want to be more optimistic, you know, and want to say, no, you know, we, we can make things better. And uh, if you're feeling terrified at 20, that's not a particularly right. uh, good thing, you know. Right. So, uh, so in that sense, yeah, I do think it's uh, apocalyptic. I think it needs to be taken seriously, but I'm not surprised that there are different takes on it. Right, right. Uh, so you basically knew Rene from 2000 till when he passed away in 2015, 15 yeah. years, essentially. Yeah. So in these 15 years, let me ask you, did he have an impact on you intellectually in your thoughts, intellectual thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, I, the book that I wrote on uh, uh, Rousseau was, it's a, he wrote the, the forward to it. Uh, it's basically my use of his thought applied to the text of Rousseau. And uh, I found it to be, uh, and this is, you know, aside from the person, if I just talk about, uh, say, mimetic theory in a kind of objective sense, what I found helpful about it is both in terms of the scriptures, but then also in terms of non-canonical writings or uh, secular writings, it opens up text for me. Okay, and, and in that sense, I find it very powerful. And it's not the only way, it's not the only thing, but for me, it, uh, it really gets at, uh, a basic anthropological reality, namely violence, that I think we just too often turn away from. We don't want to look at it. And uh, Girard's thought helps us to look at it, it gives us tools and uh, uh, the conceptual uh, apparatus by which we can handle some of those things. That being said, that's sort of the intellectual approach. And so I continue to use, I'm working on and have been working for a number of years on Kant right now. And I'm just finding more and more mimetic reality in Kant. You know, he's more and more a mimetic thinker than I think anyone has ever guessed, you know. Uh, and uh, that's very exciting. And so, again, you see new dimensions of a thinker. You see new vistas opening up. Or you see old things in a new light, things like that. But I also, there's something about Rene's thought for me that also gives me the courage to look at it. So even though I know some people maybe feel like the last book uh, is too dark or something, uh, the man himself was not dark, Rene was not. He was light, uh, light in both senses of the word, uh, illuminating, but also uh, easy to be with. 
you know, you never, at least I never felt, uh, I, besides my own initial uh, nervousness and stuff, I never felt from him a heaviness. Uh, I always felt very welcomed and, uh, uh, you know, someone who was willing to listen to me and uh, uh, freely comment on what I said without uh, fear or favor, as they say, you know, so it was just very easy to be with him. Uh, so he continues to have uh, an impact on me intellectually, but also uh, I would say spiritually, you could say uh, personally in the sense of giving me uh, courage. How, courage, how so? Well, as I said, I think we're, we don't wanna look at violence. We don't wanna face it uh, in ourselves more than anything else, but we also don't wanna face it in the text that we read or in the, uh, phenomenon and social phenomenon that we look at we and not just violence i mean we don't want to look at envy we don't want to look at uh rivalry rivalry yeah yeah N none of us have any rivals right we you know it's that classic sort of thing that we can see rivalry in everybody else but if you ask me do i have any rivals oh no no you know, no <laughs> i'm even struck by by <laughs> Renee's colleagues who will always claim, well, we never had a mimetic rifle. I'm just like, oh, come on, guys. You know? Anyway, it's fine. Uh, uh, we don't want to look at it. And uh, he helps me to be at least a little bit more willing to entertain the possibility that I might also be rivalous. And that's, I think, very early on, what drew me to his way of thinking was that it was self-implicatory. That is that it wasn't just about other people. You know, it wasn't about finding scapegoats. It was about trying to deep down identify the way that I scapegoat others. And that's a pretty uncomfortable enterprise. And I would say I've spent uh, much of the time since uh, you know, first reading him, sort of doing interior work on being more honest about the way I scapegoat or about the way I'm in rivalry. I was talking once with, uh, uh, yeah, names always just slip out right when I need them, Eric Gans. Yeah. And uh, we were like going up in an elevator together or something. We were talking about rivalry. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, two thirds of the time I'm in rivalry with someone. And I said, only, <laughs> only two thirds, you know? That's, and he said, well, I have to sleep sometimes. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel. It's just an ever present reality that, uh, you know, you, you keep finding new dimensions of. What did you think of his Shakespeare book? Did you get a chance to read that book? I did. I, I loved it. And uh, that, that's one of those works I continually find new things in, you know, that uh, like there's some just some jewels on scandal in his analysis of the Twelfth Night. And, you know, how or why that works out that way kind of amazes me. But uh, I can go to that book. Uh, uh, almost any time and just uh, just read a few pages and sort of be blown away again by uh, some insight in it. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I, how would I put it? Uh, you, you know, it was published by Oxford University Press, so it's not like it didn't get uh, noticed or something. But I'm, I am always a little bit disappointed that uh, experts in Shakespeare don't take it more seriously. I, I think it's, uh, uh, I'm not myself an expert in Shakespeare, but I've read, a, I've read all of his plays and I've read a fair amount of secondary sources. And uh, I, you know, the book by Goddard, I think, Harold Goddard, The Meaning of Shakespeare. 
uh, and and Renee's book. Those would be the two books I would choose for reading Shakespeare. What book of Renee's would you use to teach? Uh, I've, I've used uh, Scapegoat a lot. Scapegoat. And the reason I use it is because he starts with that example from uh, uh, medieval France, uh, the text, uh, uh, King of Navarre, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, prologue to it, where you get uh, this very uh, straightforward uh, uh, description of the plague and of what happens to the Jews, right? And the, the person who's writing it believes he's writing the truth. And yet we can read that and see, uh, well, yeah, that there are parts of it that are true and then there are parts of it that are clearly false. And uh, it's, it's a very, uh, for students, I think a very easy to grasp exercise to go through this uh, historical text, but to see, we don't just take it at face value, we read it critically, and we understand that what's behind this text is uh, some uh, act of violence, mob violence that uh, then get, distorts the text in certain predictable ways. And once they kind of get that uh, model, and here in Japan, you know, I can point out to them, I can say, you know, is there any, do you see any, know any parallels to something like this? And in 1920, the great Kanto earthquake, you have the great Kanto earthquake, you have the crisis, you have the minority, which are Koreans who lived in the Tokyo area. You have rumors about this minority that they poisoned the wells. And then you have violence against minorities. And most of the students know about this. They know about this historical incident. And so it just lines up so precisely that, uh, and, and then he really just builds the whole book out of that. And so it's this one long argument of just trying to expand that more and more. So let's look at uh, myths. Let's discuss what a myth is in terms of its cultural significance. Uh, and, and I think it gives some believability to the fact that uh, the scapegoat mechanism is a, is a culturally foundational mechanism. And if, if you can accept all that, and then you say, well, now let's look at the crucifixion and see how that sort of reprises all of these kind of things. It reprises the culturally foundational mechanism, but rather than being a myth, it's a gospel, it exposes it. And I'm teaching in Japan, so I'm teaching a lot of people who aren't Christian, have never even opened the Bible, you start talking about Paul and their question is Paul who, right? What's his last name? They just don't know. And, and so I don't have to ask them to have any presuppositions about faith or anything. It's just, let's just look at these texts and let's look at this argument and see if you accept it. And an awful lot of people are uh, really blown away by it. They're really uh, amazed at the role of violence in culture, the role of violence in our lives, the role of scapegoating in Japanese culture. You know, it's all over the place once well, they- well, You mentioned uh, in our last discussion that the word scapegoat doesn't exist in Japanese. Am I correct? No, uh, uh, Renee says that at one point uh, in some interview or something. And it was, it was uh, it's historically true. But just the other day, I saw it in print. They used the word scapegoat. In Japanese? Yeah. Scapegoat. It does exist. Yeah. Yeah. Scapegoat. Uh, yeah. And they have some other expressions for it. So when the scapegoat was translated as, uh, well, it was translated more directly from the French, the emissaire bourg. It's uh, translated as the, the goat that's cast out. Right. But they have some other words that are not direct translations uh, that are very close. Like if you say to a Japanese, do you know about uh, Hashirabashi, Hashirabashi, which means the 
column or support of a bridge, uh, they, they know what that means. Because what it means in Japanese, it isn't talking about the column of the bridge. It's talking about the victim, the young virgin that's buried at the base of that column. Because that's what they used to do when they were building bridges. In order to dedicate the bridge, in order to get it built, they sacrifice someone. And so they have cultural concepts that are quite close to uh, scapegoat or to the uh, sacrificial victim. And have you managed to teach things hidden? I have never taught that, no. Uh, Too complicated, probably. Actually, I, I think I did once in, uh, we, we, we teach, uh, this is probably not of interest here, but we teach in 10 week terms, like quarters in a book like-, like Stanford. Uh, Stanford is quarter also, right. So a, thing, a book like Things Hidden is just too much for uh, our students. Although it is, it is translated into Japanese, all, almost all of his work outside of uh, Battling to the End or uh, Ashere Clausewitz, everything has been translated into Japanese. So, which book of his do you use to teach Christianity? Scapegoat is the, uh, the I use for the introduction to Christianity. Uh, I have used uh, I See Things Fall. I See Satan Fall. I See uh, Satan Fall like lightning. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, it's also very good and it's more sort of set up that way. Uh, it starts with uh, scandal and with uh, the scriptures. Uh, but in a certain sense for a Japanese audience, again, I find it almost uh, presumes too much. Okay. You have to be a Christian Judeo, you have to know your Judeo-Christian text in order to really understand what's going on. Okay. Right. right. Okay. So in these 15 years, what was, you mentioned it, but what was your first interaction with Rene when you met him? So, well, my very first one was at this, uh, I gave a paper at uh, Stanford at this uh, seminar. And uh, I, I won't go into the, all the details, but it was a very unpleasant experience. Unpleasant? Uh, yeah, because Why? Bob Hammerton Kelly bit okay. my head off. And uh, so I love Bob and we became close friends afterwards, but uh, he is a bit of a bully. <laughs> and uh, I know that. <laughs> It was on display and I, I came from Japan. I mean, literally I had gotten off the plane, gone from the airport to Stanford to give this paper. Right. And I was saying a few things and Bob put up his hand and said, do you mind if I interrupt if I ask a question? I said, no, you know, please feel free. And he <laughs> said, yeah, because you're just sitting there hemming and hawing and not saying anything. Who? Bob said that to me. Right. You know, you're hemming and hawing and not saying anything. I see. And I, I just was flabbergasted. Is that how you talk to a guest? You know, I mean, in Japan, we just don't do this. I right. mean, I've been out of the States. I, I was coming to start a sabbatical in the States. I had not lived in the United States for more than 20 years. Uh, so most of that in Japan, six of it in Germany. Uh, I just wasn't used Ready to for that. that. Yeah. And so I kind of shut up and then someone else finally said, well, shouldn't we hear a little bit more from him? Because he came all this way to give a paper. So I talked a little bit more. And again, Bob did something. And so about three times. And then finally, I just realized uh, I needed to stand up to him. And so I did. He said something and I... I I replied back. He said something like, well, that doesn't really matter. And I said, well, it doesn't matter if you don't care about spreading the gospel. And uh, that Bob just kind of stared, shocked at me. And Renee said, he's right. Who's right? I'm what? right. He said, he's You're right. right. Yeah. And, and he was very your quiet. Side. Yeah. And he just said, he's right. And that was the first real words I heard from Renee and uh, and then and then things went much smoother in the presentation and it ended up being a very pleasant experience 
and uh, I got to know Bob Hamilton Kelly better and understood a little bit more the way he operates. And uh, and and through that, then so I, you know after that I was seeing Renee on a more regular basis. I'd go out to lunch with him sometimes. Uh, uh, I got, I can't remember the first time exactly, but I got to know Martha then. I started, uh, you know, going to his house on occasion and uh, getting to know Martha as well. Also, uh, starting in 2004, I started to attend Cover and uh, 2003, 2004. Anyway, the Innsbruck conference was the first one I went to. And Martha would always accompany him. And so uh, got to know them uh, through those conferences as well. Uh, I, I think I might have mentioned this in the last time. The, the other thing I was, uh, during those years, I was in the process of leaving the Society of Jesus and uh, leaving the priesthood. And uh, that was so it was a, a difficult time in my own life in a lot of ways. But towards the end of it, uh, I was able to introduce my future wife to them. And my wife is someone who doesn't particularly like academics or doesn't take them very well. But she she loved <laughs> she really from the very first uh, uh, really uh, appreciated him and and. Uh, uh, was just very, very fond of him. Uh, and so after that, uh, when my second child was born, we asked Renee and Martha to be the godparents and they agreed to it. And so we, uh, at that time we were living in another place. We flew to the Bay Area and uh, had a mass uh, and Bob Hamilton Kelly and his wife Rosemary drove uh, Renee and Martha out to Berkeley where the mass was and we all celebrated uh, the baptism of my daughter. So. Mazel tov, as we say in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. That's wonderful. That was very nice. Yeah. What, what year was that? That would have been, she was born in 2007, March. So I think it was around Christmas of 2007. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I would imagine you guys st stayed in touch after that. We did, and we would go visit. Uh, even uh, I have some pictures of uh, my children uh, standing beside Renee. He's sitting. He's ill at the time. I mean, he's already had the strokes, and he can't really speak. But we went and visited uh, Martha, uh, showed my daughters around Stanford, and uh, we had uh, a meal with them. and. Uh, things. So we visited him. I visited him a couple times after the strokes uh, when he couldn't really speak, but just spent time with him. Uh, and then uh, after he, when he died, uh, I couldn't come to the funeral, but my whole family, so my daughters also, my wife and daughters came to Stanford for the memorial service. And we spent a fair amount of time with Martha. We were at her house the whole afternoon and the next morning, uh, just visiting with her and stuff. Tell me something. Um, obviously, you're a strong Catholic, and obviously, mm -hmm. Rene was a strong Catholic, and obviously, um, there was a love that you had for Rene that you asked Rene and Martha to be the godparents of your daughter. Uh, did Rene have an impact on your Catholicism and your Catholic faith at all? Yeah, uh, he, he did. Uh, I've always been, uh, I mean, yeah, I was raised in a Catholic family and I've always been a very strong Catholic. And in that sense, he didn't uh, uh, strengthen that in the sense that uh, it was never that weak. But he certainly uh, helped me to really have more confidence in the faith, uh, more confidence uh, uh, as, a, as a Catholic intellectual, that uh, we really do have something to offer to society, to academia, and that we shouldn't be shy about that. Uh, we don't need to be strident either, but 
and, and in that sense, his both his own bearing, his own confidence, uh, but also, uh, I'm, you know, sometimes when you read him, there's a, there, there is a more uh, polemical tone or, or a more strident tone. I never found it uh, in personal dealings with him. When, even when we spoke about people we might disagree with, uh, I always found him very, uh, at a, he just had an equilibrium about it all that uh, even in church matters, he didn't seem to, I wouldn't really identify him with right or left myself. You know, I just didn't feel a strong, uh, always really a conservative Catholic or always really a liberal Catholic. I just didn't, that didn't seem to be what interested him. You know, and so uh, that I, I found very uh, uh, congenial to my own view of things. What kind of a person did he strike you as in these years that you knew him, his personality, his persona? Uh, so I, I would have uh, first got to know him a little bit after 2000. So he was already an older man, retired. Uh, and I think uh, I talked about a little bit uh, just a few minutes ago, the, the word uh, light uh, comes to me, both uh, an illumination and uh, a lack of heaviness. Uh, and I, you know, for me, uh, there are a number of stories, but one that uh, has always stayed with me was, was at the colloquium on violence and religion. And so uh, the fact that we call it that the colloquium, the speaking, he was, it was the one that was held in Ottawa and he was going to be interviewed by the Canadian broadcast company. And he, uh, there was some sort of delay setting up the equipment. So he's kind of just standing there in the hallway, a, a little bit lost, Martha wasn't around. And uh, I, stopped to chat with him and he, he said yeah i'm waiting for this so i said well let's sit down and so we did we sat there more or less in the hallway uh kind of an alcove and just started chatting and i don't really remember much of the content but uh someone walked by and saw us and said oh can is it okay if i sit down and we, of course you know and and then someone else came by and said well, can i join you and it gradually grew to a group of about 12 or 15 people sitting in kind of a large circle, just having a very pleasant conversation uh, about, uh, you know, it was dealing with his thought, different, very, and again, I don't really remember the content, but what I remember is the tone and the atmosphere. And uh, you had a number of different people. You had people uh, like, Andrew McKenna, who had already knew Renee for years and years, and you yes. had new people who were kind of just like in awe. Can, can I, can I sit down? <laughs> and and eventually everyone just got comfortable, uh, not just with Renee but with each other. And I I just marveled at it that he was uh, without doing anything he was able to do this, uh, bring a group of people together like that and let them have a conversation. And he uh, was only dominant in the sense that people wanted to hear from him. Right. And in that sense, then he spoke more than others, but not in the sense that he wasn't more than willing to listen to what others had to say. I think that humility was part of what uh, drew my wife, you know, to him was just, uh, here's this great man, you know, who seems to be very friendly and nice and you know, kind of a, uh, she was just very pleased with that. Good. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Altberg, and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, I look forward to it.